Good evening, everybody. Today we have a very special guest with us in the webinar series. We have uh, Professor Wayne Brockbank with us all the way um, from the US. He's uh, taken his time to uh, you know spend this time with us and uh, share all his knowledge. Professor Wayne Brockbank is a very accomplished um, academician. He's been a consultant to uh, many of the Fortune 500 companies across the world. Uh, his works have been seminal in, in the HR space. He's contributed to uh, several fundamental ideas in, in HR, um, you know, right from, uh, you know, conceptualizing uh, fundamental tenets in HR value proposition, uh, competencies, uh, contributing to uh, HR transformation, um, writing books, uh, doing research, uh, both at, uh, at, at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business and at uh, RBL Group, um, the consulting organization that uh, uh, Professor Wayne Brockbank is, is a chairman uh, partner emeritus at. Uh, he's, he's an exemplary educator um, he has conducted executive programs uh, um, across the world, whether it is Singapore, Hong Kong, um, all over the US. Uh, he's been to India uh, multiple times over and is very, very familiar with uh, uh, you know, businesses in India, um, worked with many uh, uh, you know, leaders from India. Um, he's worked with, uh, you know, universities from Australia, Hungary, uh, uh, the Czech Republic, Saudi Arabia, Ireland. So he understands the human uh, resource context across the world. Uh, he's here to share with us um, many of the learnings that he's had. Uh, he works with 100,000 plus uh, HRs and has done extensive research around how HR is evolving and is contributing to, to uh, the change within HR. And um, today we are going to talk about uh, the primary topic, which is all the stakeholders that HR is managing. And um, you know, we believe that there's, there's, there's lots of change. Uh, we'll get to soak in uh, all the nuggets of wisdom um, from Professor Wayne uh, Brockbank today. So thank you everybody for coming here. And uh, over to you, Dr. Wayne. This is really great. Thank you so much for that kind invitation. Uh, yesterday, I had to turn it. Yeah, it's towards the end of the year. And at the end of the year, we have to turn in our, our summaries of our professional uh, uh, progress to the dean of the business school. And I wish that he could have been on the, on the webinar listening to that introduction today. <laughs> that would have helped my that would have helped my career. So thank you so much. Uh, so I'm delighted to be with you. I'm going to uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to go in uh, when we're ready. Uh, I'm ready to go into presentation mode. Uh, can you see now my presentation? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So wh wh why don't we wait for just two more minutes? Um, I think we already have about seventy. Uh, attendees, I think once we, we cross about 75, we can get started. And okay. uh, I think all the others will join soon. So thank you everybody for coming in. Um, we hope you have a wonderful session. All right. So I think we have uh, the minimum number to get started. So um, why don't we do that? And I think uh, we are we are getting in a few more people. Um, I'm sure, uh, Dr. Wayne, you are familiar with IST, Indian Stretchable Time. I am. I am. <laughs> right. So you're not you're not uh, new to this phenomenon, and I think uh, you know. Not at all. Not at fantastic. all. Fantastic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Great. 
Okay, ready so we to already go. have people who are asking us if they've not missed anything. Don't worry, Madhulika, you've not missed anything. Uh, Dr. Wayne, I think we're good to go. You can please okay. begin. Okay, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you today. This is great fun. Uh, if this were being held in person, this would be, this would be my 129th trip to India. So oh, I've wow. done a lot of traveling to India over my career. Uh, sometimes I joke with my, my wife and I say, India is kind of my second home. And my wife will say, you're in India so much, that's kind of like your first home, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so I'm delighted to be with you. Um, uh, let me start by saying, in my heart of hearts, I've, I've, I love HR, I love what it accomplishes, and we're gonna talk about why uh, a little bit today. But um, the, other, the other identifying probably characteristic of me, as opposed to many, many individuals who talk about HR, is in my heart of heart, I'm an empiricist. That means that I like to rely upon large scale research to, to, to ground or to provide a foundation for anything that I teach. And that's going to be the case today. Uh, at the University of Michigan, we have the largest database in the world on HR professionals has been indicated uh, in, in terms of an ongoing research agenda. Uh, for we've been working on this research since 1987, and we have over 100,000 people that are in our database from around the world, including at least as I my and my last count, the largest database uh, from India about HR professionals. We wish we had more <clears throat> relative to the importance of HR in India. We wish we had a greater representation. Um, but we still have the largest database in India and certainly maybe around the world. So uh, that's, uh, so again, I'm in my heart of heart, I'm an empiricist. So today we're going to talk about balancing the requirements of HR multiple stakeholders. So, uh, and that consists of several parts. So who are the stakeholders and what are their requirements and how can HR meet those requirements of the multiple stakeholders? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna move fairly quickly through a lot of material. And I hope it, we hope it'll be useful for you. Uh, obviously, we live in a world that is highly uncertain. <laughs> the, the economic, social, political e e uh, ecosystem has radically changed this year. We've always talked about change in the HR field. Uh, this year, uh, and we have research that says that under conditions of stability, HR statistically doesn't matter very much. When things are stable, you just have to continue what, what you've been doing and you'll continue to be successful. But when things are unstable, statistically, that's when HR becomes statistically important. And the good news is that in today's world, HR doesn't need to go out looking for change, the change is looking for HR. So that's the world we live in today. And obviously the coronavirus has created uh, this economic turmoil it's changed the nature of, of, of the way we work. We used to work face-to-face. -face. Now we have sessions like today that we're connected through technology. So that is a radical change in the way of, of, our, of the changes that are occurring that, fa that confront us all. Um, but we need to keep in mind that someday the coronavirus is going to go away. And even in the middle of coronavirus, the business challenges are the same. And the business challenges are, how do you design, make, and sell products and services better than your competition? That's the basic formula still. And as HR becomes uh, tagged or targeted, especially with the responsibility for changing the way we work and how we work, that's important. But at the end of the day, the business proposition remains the same. It's not how we work, it's the work we do. How do we, uh, how we do, uh, how we design, make, and sell products and services better than the competition. That's what HR needs to focus on. And that's where, and so we're, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, now, in that world, there's, uh, in addition to the uh, disruptions that are occurring uh, in the, in, because of coronavirus and the economic meltdown and the way that we're experiencing uh, uh, 
uh, interacting through technology. We're interacting through technology, but we're still interacting. That's the key issue. We used to interact face to face. Now we interact through technology. So the interaction is still the same. And when the other major change, obviously we live in a world, the, the, the other great change in the world today is the proliferation of information technology. And, uh, you know, and there's several examples of that. Let me give you just one quick. If you were to take a single sheet of paper like this and you were to, t and you were to write on it a single space on both sides of the paper and you lay those pages page by page by page on top of each other and you, and you, and you took that stack of papers page by page, both sides of the paper from here to the moon, that's a lot of paper and you come back, that's still a, that's twice as much paper. That is a huge amount of information. And you make that trip 68,000 times from here to the moon and back, single space pages, both sides, from here to the moon and back 68,000 times. That's the amount of information that's available on the earth today. So the companies that live in that world and succeed in that world, will be the ones that will have sustainable success and uh, be able to meet the requirements of their markets into the future. So the point is, we live in a, a, a world of radical change. Another set of changes is national boundaries are changing. India is reaching out. Uh, you probably know there are more India CEOs uh, out probably outside of India than there are India CEOs within India some of the best managed companies in the world now outside of India and including in India, but outside of India are managed by, uh, by Indian nationals. So the world, so India is the, is the most important world's net exporter of executive talent. So you're reaching out of your, your national boundaries and having that influence. China is reaching outside of its natural, in, its uh, national boundaries with the, with the Silk Road. So there's lots of changes that are occurring geographically. In sectors, the, 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 the change in sectors is just is, is unprecedented. Uh, now, Walmart used to be a very successful company. Now it has to compete with Amazon. Uh, General Motors used to be a, a very successful company and it has to compete with Google. And both of these companies, you know, uh, General Motors and Walmart say, so what's going on here? These aren't our competitors. Well, they are today. So you see that complexity of geography and the complexity of sectors, and you overlay the sector complexity with sector, uh, with geographical complexity, and, and you multiply that times the change and acceleration of information uh, technology, and you find a radically changing competitive environment. And it's the companies that can function in that environment are the ones that succeed. But keeping in mind that it's not what you do that determines success, who determines success is your stakeholders. They're the ones that say if you're doing what they want. They're the ones that vote with their money that tell you if you're doing what they want. So let's talk about HR's role relative to stakeholders. As I indicated, the University of Michigan, we have the largest database in the world. Uh, in the last round of, of our survey, uh, we added an additional 32,000 people to this data set. And if you factor analyze, I assume most of you know, factor, analyze, factor analysis identifies what are the patterns in the data. We were able to statistically identify across all HR department practice areas that there are four bundles or categories of, of, uh, of HR practice areas. The, the first is HR uh, employee performance, which essentially consists of the bundle of measurement, rewards, training, and development. So it's that bundle of measurement, rewards, and training. We call that employee performance. Then the next, the next category is uh, what we call strategically integrated HR practice areas. And that consists of, the, and we call it strategically integrated, because the, the, that category consists of HR practices that have a line of sight to strategy that then provides the criteria 
for designing and delivering the culture and organization capabilities you need to have to succeed to execute your strategy. And finally then, the HR specific functional practices that create and sustain organization capability that then is critical for the strategy. So that's, that's why we call it strategically integrated. Strategy, organization capability, and HR practices. That integration is, is a very important bundle of HR practice. The third, which is kind of new, and that's gonna, and I'm gonna introduce that today. Some of you probably have not, are not familiar with this, but you probably know more about this than you thought you knew, but I'll explain that later. And that's HR's role in information management. It's not taking over the IT department, it's HR's role in helping to identify the most important external information, making sure that information is brought into the firm, deeply into the firm, is then analyzed and optimally identified through the patterns that are in that information, then share those facts and findings and making sure then they're used. So, and some of you are saying, well, that doesn't sound like HR. Well, that's not the HR of the history, but it certainly is the HR of the future. And we'll talk more about that today. And finally, the last category, the last bundle of HR department practice areas has to do with HR analytics. That's kind of the flavor of the month in HR now. That is, how do we measure and track HR's performance? How do we use HR analytics to improve HR decision making and so forth? So H, you can almost not go to an HR conference anywhere in the world without HR analytics being talked about. That's kind of the flavor of the month. Uh, uh, and and it and it's a and it's an important area. So those are the four HR practice areas. Now here's the question I'd like to ask. Those are so you think about who are HR's stakeholders? Okay, we have lots of stakeholders. We have that is who provide requirements that HR needs to meet: regulators, government, investors, owners, external buying customers, employees, short-term financial results communities that we live in and, and work in, and line managers. So line managers, communities, short-term financial, financial results, employees, external buying customers, investors, and regulators. So the question is, let's go back here. As you might guess, some of these HR practice areas might have more influence in creating value for some of these stakeholders that other HR practice areas might have. So the question is, how do we link this page with that page? So I would like you to, in your own minds right now, think about, so which of the following must your firm focus on for you to have optimal, sustainable success? Which are the ones that your business needs to focus on to be successful? Now, I wish we had time to do it, to, to, and, and we have this, we, we've studied this. We don't have a large data set on this one, but we have about two or 3,000 people that have responded to this question over the last year. And so we have several thousand. Uh, and what we find is number one ends up being external buying customers, following second by line managers, employees, and investors. That, those, three kind, those three kind of come in second and then the rest of them trail off, uh, with third being short-term financial results, and then we go into regulators and so forth. So, so those are our stakeholders, but, but I want you to think about your primary stakeholders. Who are your one or two most important stakeholders your firm must focus on and understand and focus on their requirements in order to be successful? Okay, so here's the answer to that question. In this, this is probably one of the most important charts of data, HR data, that probably, well, that might exist in the world today. I think it is the most important, but let me be uh, circumspect and say it's probably. So let me explain. So here's the stakeholders we just talked about. Let's start over here. Here is business, short-term business performance. That is financial performance in the short run, three years or so. External buying customers, owners, investors, communities, regulators, line managers, and employees. Okay. <clears throat> Here are the four categories of the bundles of HR practice areas. Employee performance, measurement, rewards, training, strategically integrate HR practices, strat uh, business strategy, 
organization capability and HR practices to integrate and reinforce each other. HR analytics we talked about and HR's role in information management, how to import, analyze, import, analyze, and utilize information at an optimal level, at an organization level. HR analytics is applying HR uh, information logic to itself. This, this last one is HR, HR information management, is HR applying information logic as an organization capability to the rest of the organization. So those are those four. So these numbers represent what percent of HR's value that is created for each of these stakeholders is created by each of these bundles of HR department practice areas. Let me give you an example. Let's go to line managers because we're all interested in making sure our line managers are happy <laughs> and our employees. I, and those are similar numbers you can see. So let's look at line managers. If you look at what creates value for line managers is strategically integrated HR practices. That is that integration. They look at us and they say, we have a, we have a business strategy. The question is, we see that HR creates value if it, if it makes sure that the organization capabilities are designed and created to deliver the strategy that then is created and then those organization capabilities are just are created and sustained by the collective HR practices, by what we measure, reward, train, develop, uh, promote, hire, communicate, uh, design, and have leaders to, to execute. So it's that integration. So that's what creates the, that 57% is, that's what creates the greatest value for line managers then employ short-term financial performance uh, or uh, measurement rewards and training, that tends to have kind of mediocre influence in creating value for line managers, as does HR analytics and HR information. So I'm hoping you, could, you can look at that chart then. Now, this, the mean scores, this is a five point scale. And this, is, this evaluates, by the way, let, I'm sorry, let, let me go, go one other level. To create value for external customers, notice what happens. The what is the most important activity for HR departments to create value for external customers is HR's role in information management at 40, 45%. That is, that what creates value for external customers is if HR helps to play a role to making sure the organization understands through the information that is accessed about customers that brings that information into the firm, makes sure it's optimally analyzed and shared throughout the organization and finally is utilized. And that, and when HR plays a role doing that, that's what HR does to create the greatest value for customers. That's not the same. And when we go to strategically integrated HR practice areas, that creates a, a moderate amount of value, but not nearly the value for customers as does this HR's role in information management. Now over here, the mean scores, this is a five point scale. And what this says is that what we do best is employee performance HR management. And that, and that has impact on short-term business performance, but tends not to create value across the entire stakeholder value chain. Whereas HR's role in information management, that's the worst thing we do. And that's understandable because this is a new agenda. And that's what our research at Michigan, we always try to identify. What are the, what are the practices that are adding, that tend not to be done well around the world, but when they are done well, create the greatest value for our stakeholders. And, and because if something isn't done well ar around the world, but it, but in places where it are, is done well, it creates value, we call that opportunity. We call that potential competitive advantage. So we are always looking for that intersection of things that add value, but tend not to be done well, because that's the area of opportunity. And, and if you look at, uh, at this HR information management, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes, that's what we do worst. And, and yet it creates the greatest value for customers, investors, um, and, uh, and, uh, and comes close to regulators and for communities. So um, 
but what we're going to do now is divide up. So, so this information role, uh, HR's role in information management has greatest impact on customers and investors. But what has greatest impact on line managers and employees is in a strategically integrated HR practices area. One final finding before we leave this chart. If you add up the variance that is accounted for across all stakeholders, that system. If you add up all the all the percent of value that's created for all stakeholders and add them up, what creates the greatest value across all stakeholders is strategically integrated HR practices. Okay, that's that's what this number tells us. But what creates the greatest value for a targeted population of customers, investors, is HR's role in information management. Okay. So these are the two we're going to focus on today for the next for the next uh, next 25 minutes or so. So we're going to start with strategically integrated HR practices because that's the that's the HR practice area that cuts across most uh, stakeholders. And that has to do with, again, having a line of sight to strategy, focusing on the culture and the HR practices that will create the culture that helps us to deliver our strategy. And as you've seen, uh, uh, you've probably heard this, seen this statement before, actually this came to India and to the world through an interview that the chairman of Emphasis had with Peter Drucker, where, he where Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and the chairman of Emphasis, uh, Mr. Murthy, uh, then came back at an interview with, with some newspapers here in India and that quote that has that that has gone throughout the world uh, came about through an interview with one of your chair, chairman of one of your leading companies uh, in an interview with Peter Drucker. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. So let's just give some examples. So how do you go about making sure that you've got the right the right culture and it's executed? So you have to have your corporate strategy. What businesses are you in? What are the market trends within those businesses? Okay, then how do we translate those trends into, into your business strategy? Then once you understand what your corporate strategy, what businesses you're in, what's going on in the marketplace for those businesses, what's your business strategy you're going to execute to, um, uh, to meet the requirements of those external priorities, then you have to ask the question, what is the culture we have to have to execute that strategy? And finally, then, what are the HR practices we'll put into place to create that culture that will help us to execute our strategy, that will help us to meet the requirements of our stakeholder, extra of our of our customers and competitors, and to beat our competitors. So that's the way that you go about identifying identifying the culture you need to have based upon its strategy in the marketplace and then using your HR practices to create that culture. So let me give some examples of some companies that have done that. Um, let's start with uh, IBM very quickly. Um, when Lou Gerstner came in as the chairman of IBM uh, many, many years ago, many years ago, uh, by the way, we had I had an opportunity to visit with, uh, I, I spent a number of years working very closely with the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority in, in Abu Dhabi. In fact, I just left there a, a few months ago uh, while I, I, I would still go back and teach at the university every couple of months, but I was living in Abu Dhabi for several years. So Lou Gerstner came to visit the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. He told us this story. Uh, when he first came in as chairman, uh, IBM was, was, the board was preparing to divide IBM into separate business, into nine separate businesses. The shareholder said, look, it, IBM has failed to make the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So, so we believe that IBM shareholders will be, be, be better off if we created uh, nine separate companies. And, and so they were going to divide up the company. That was the day that Lou Gerstner was supposed, supposed to become the chairman of IBM. But I was going to become the chairman of the biggest of the nine, but only one of the nine. And he knew that was going to happen. So he said he came to the board that day when he was supposed to be announced, which was the same day they were voting to to bust up IBM. And they and, and he said, look, it, give me nine months 
to create to to integrate IBM and to make the IBM whole greater than the sum of the parts. And if I fail, and he handed them a pre, a post dated resignation letter, so if I fail, then I will re, I will quit. You can fire me, whatever you want to do, and you won't have to pay me severance. So give me nine months to fix it, and 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 then. Um, and if I fix it, you'll be better off. And if I don't fix it, uh, then you won't have to pay me severance. So that afternoon, he called in the nine heads of the he called in the nine heads of those of those nine businesses that heretofore had been entirely separate silos. And some of you can identify with that. They had separate businesses, separate silos, and they weren't working together. And the reason they weren't working together is their measurement, rewards, training, uh, promotions all occurred within the silos. So they were heavily focused on their silos. So he called these nine folks in and he said, okay, as of today, 100% of your bonus depends on IBM's performance, not your business unit's performance. And, and if you can't do that, those who can live with that will will succeed and stay those that can't will have to leave three of them said you can't do that so embedded was their mindset in the silos they said to the new chairman you can't do that he said no i can and you're fired three so three of them were gone three of them said well we think we can maybe we can it'll be difficult we could okay you've got three months to do it Two of the three made it, one of the three didn't make it. And three of them said, that's right, that's what we should have been doing all along. And 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 so during Lou Gerstner's tenure, and that's this, IBM worked together and became a fabulously well-integrated company. And notice what his points of leverage were, measurement, rewards, and staffing. Those were the levers he used to create the culture of cross-unit collaboration. So he knew his strategy, he knew the organization capability he needed to have, the culture he needed to have, and he leveraged the HR practice areas to get there. That makes, I hope you see that, that connection. That's strategically integrated HR practice areas. Okay, uh, let's see, we don't, that's Steve Job. Uh, this is HUL, this is, this is a practice at HUL that is world famous, uh, and, uh, and this is one of the practices they use to create a culture of customer-centric innovation. You all know the story where they take their new management trainees that come out of the best families, the best schools, who have probably never interacted with, with folks out on the remote villages where a lot of HUL's products are sold. And, and that's the disconnect that, that as they've got people that come out, new management trainees that come out of out of wealth, uh, out of very wealthy families that go to the best universities, they hire some of the best people out of the best universities, and the question is, how do they connect them with their with their buying customers? And and as you all know the story, they send these folks out to the out to live in the remote villages, uh, and it depends a little bit on the flow of, of business, but sometimes they're out there. What's well, certainly in most American companies. Well, we'll send you out for a few hours to roam the villages and look around. In Europe, they might send them out to look around for a couple of couple of days, but HUL, as you know, they send them out for months to live in the villages to understand not just in their heads what's going on in their customers, but in their hearts what's going on in their customers. And based upon that intense understanding and appreciation for their customers, uh, HUL then brings them back in, and that becomes the the foundational uh, the foundation of their success in beating uh, Procter and Gamble in India, the only place where H uh, in uh, uh, Unilever beats uh, uh, Procter and Gamble regularly is is in India, and that's because of the training, the external sensing. That is, they get their people out and they gather information about what's going on in the markets. They put them in the physical setting of the, of the remote locations, and they leverage those three HR practice areas to create the culture 
of customer centric innovation where the people have a, a, a passion for their for their customers that they're serving um, okay so I, I hope you get the point here's here's one last one um, uh, here's the FedEx mission statement my favorite mission statement uh, okay and and some of you are gonna say you don't like it but that's okay so here's the FedEx mission statement it's your job not to screw this up, make any mistake, or drop the ball or blow the game. Get it there faster, quicker, more reliably, more efficiently. Do it right, first rate, top notch, without a hitch, absolutely flawlessly. Box this one, that is make a mistake, and you're out of here. History finished, terminated, toast, lunch, gonzo, dead, kaput. And one more thing, do it for less money than you've ever done it before. For, for, for two decades, this was the FedEx mission statement. They changed it about three or four, four or five years ago. Now, that, some of you are saying, wow, that is really nasty. That is overbearing. That is insensitive. That is, that is not politically correct. That is, that is unrealistic. That is just nasty. That is a terrible statement. But um, maybe, you, maybe you may think that. But here, let me ask you three questions. Is it, is it clear? Do you have any questions what they're trying to say? What are the cultural messages? Speed, reliability, and timeliness, and, and low cost, excuse me. Speed, uh, time, uh, timeliness, reliability, and low cost. So that's the culture they're focusing on. So it's clear. Number one, number two, is it is it strategically accurate? And strategically accurate, that means, is it connected to their strategy? If FedEx does that, what happens to the customer wallets? If they live that, that mission statement, uh, FedEx's customers take money out of their wallets and give that money to FedEx. Yeah. And if they don't do that, what happens to customer wallets? What happens to customer wallets? That money comes out of the customer wallets and it goes into their competitor's wallet. So that is critical. That organization capability is critical to meet the requirements of, of, the mar of, of their customers. Now, some of you might say, that's really nasty. That's right. It is nasty. And I wish we could all, I wish we were all here in person in a big auditorium and I would ask you to all raise your hands. So, so I'd ask you to all raise your hand. So who are those nasty, obnoxious, unrealistic, overbearing, uncaring people? Who are they? Everybody raise your hand. It's not them. It's you. It's me. What do we say to FedEx? This is exactly what we say to FedEx. When they wrote this FedEx mission statement, it was written from the standpoint, not what, we, what would we say to ourselves, but what would our customers say to us? Because we want to have our mission statement, our statement of culture to reinforce the culture we have to have in order to, to beat the competition. And they do that through their training programs, through their measurement and rewards, and through keeping and, and through making sure they're focused on the outside through external sensing. So those are some, those are just some examples of companies that live this, uh, that have, have designed and implemented their integrated HR practice areas that are based upon this integration of strategy, of corporate strategy, understanding the marketplace, their business strategy, making sure their business strategy drives and defines their cultural capabilities that then are designed and implemented by HR practice. So that's pretty cool. And that's what you use to cut across that creates greatest value across all stakeholders, especially though for line managers and employees. Now let's go to HR's role for the last few minutes in information management. And we've talked about that, that consists of HR's role in uh, helping to acquire, analyze, and apply information. We're not talking about HR information, we're talking about competitive market customer-based information. Now, some of you may be saying, that doesn't sound like HR that I've ever been involved in. Well, that's right. You remember this, this chart says that that's the worst thing we do in HR. Okay, so if you're not doing it, we understand. But actually, you maybe need more than you think you know. So the question is, what is HR's role in acquiring, analyzing, and applying competitive information as it flows through the, from the marketplace through the firm into application? 
can, can you think of any examples? Well, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the leading companies where HR does play a role in acquiring, analyzing, and applying information. Uh, let's see. Let me start with acqu acquire. Let me use Disney. So uh, acquiring the right information has to do with identifying what the most important information is, bringing and, and making sure it's brought into the firm. Uh, and there's several ways that that can be done by seeking multiple uh, multiple external sources, being intellectually curious and open minded find out what's there, what's not there. We don't have time to talk about incentive.com, but if you're taking notes, write down incentive.com and and go to that website and look it up this, uh, tomorrow or this evening and you'll find uh, a website that it where HR played a fundamental role in crowd in in crowdsourcing competitive technical information from Eli for Eli Lilly and that idea of crowdsourcing intellectual ideas about about pharmaceuticals from outside the firm was the brainchild of HR again bringing external information identifying critical information bringing it into the firm my favorite example is Disney Part of acquiring information is leveraging relationships. That is, you got relationships, so let's use that those relationships to identify to get the critical information we need to have, and br and bring it into the firm so we can meet customer requirements better. So Disney's my favorite example. Uh, some of you've been to Disney. All of you've heard of, of Disney Inc. and it's a powerful company. Uh, let me just give you a, a quick example. So. It, when you when you check into a Disney theme park, they give you one of these wristbands. Um, we went to a Disney theme park last year before COVID, and we went with our granddaughter, and 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 obviously our 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 our, our son and his family. And in these web and, and in these wristbands, you can embed a bunch of information. You can embed your name, your your room number. You use this becomes the key to get into your hotel room. By the way. Uh, your credit card, if you're an adult, your credit card information can be embedded. So as you walk through the park, you want to buy something, you don't have to reach in your wallet. You just scan this, uh, this, uh, uh, this bracelet into your into the cash register, and so that's where you pay for stuff. Also embedded in this particular case was my granddaughter's seventh birthday. Her name is Rose, and embedded in in this wristband, it, it was her was her that today was their seventh birthday. So she loves, say she loves Elsa, right, from the movie Frozen. She just, she's seen the movie dozens of times, and she loves Elsa. So we wait in line for several hours, for a long time, to get to see Elsa. And, and Rose is all excited, because now she's going to get to see Elsa. As she approaches Elsa, as, she, as Rose approaches Elsa, she gets about 10 feet away from Elsa, and in Elsa's ear, there's there's an electronic device. As Rose gets close to close to Elsa, the the wristband sends out a signal to to Elsa, and the and the message is this is Rose Brockbank's seventh birthday. Okay, so Elsa's got that information. And now notice just what happened. That information just came from the customer into Elsa. And uh, so as, as Rose approaches Elsa, Elsa holds out her hands, so she couldn't do that today, but she did, could do it last year, holds out her arms to, to Rose and says, Rose, and, and Rose jumps in her arms and says, happy birthday, Rose, how does it feel to be seven years old? And Rose, <laughs> oh, I, this is the happiest moment of her life, and she turns, and she turns around, looks at me and says, oh, Pop, oh, Grandpa, I love you. I said, okay, here's some more money. <laughs> anyway, so, but that the point is that that's the mechanism through which, one of the mechanisms through which Disney brings, uh, identifies and acquires critical information real time, realistically, and, and acts on it very quickly. Okay, so that's just an example. And, and that thought came about through a team that was heavily influenced by HR logic that asked the question, how do we link, how do we use technology to link our, our customer requirements 
with what we can do with our employees. It's really cool. I wish we had more time to talk about other things that Disney does. But, but they, they work really hard to make that connection happen. Okay, next question is, so we first, HR can play a role in acquiring, and we looked at emphasis and Disney. How, to, how can HR play a role in analyzing? Well, and, and analyzing consists of, of, of prioritizing, what, once the information comes in, how do we prioritize what we're going to analyze? How do we make sure it, it's statistically analyzed? And how do we thoroughly debate that information? BlackRock Institute is a, the BlackRock uh, investment company is the largest uh, investment company in the world. They have something like seven, uh, not seven, nine trillion dollars of investments that they manage. So it's the largest in the world. So how do they make sure that they stay ahead of the game? Every year, twice a year, they have, they bring in key speakers. These are, are kind of what some of us, uh, uh, what, they, these are some leaders of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. This year they brought, or last year they brought these folks in. The chairman, Larry Fink, speaks to this group, and they bring in also some leading economists from the, from the CFA uh, accreditation group in this case. And they bring together, you know, between, uh, between 100 to 120 of, their, of some of their high potential people to, um, to listen to the economists, their chairman and, and CEO, and some political leaders in this case. And these people are well selected. They 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 know what's at stake. If they shine in this setting, then then they then that's a key thing for their promotability. And if they don't if they don't shine, then they uh, then they uh, uh, then they kind kind of aren't invited the next time. So in that setting, there's intense debate discussion for two days. They debate and discussion what they heard from these three sources. And, uh, and they decide, therefore, what are the major messages we've heard that BlackRock needs to focus on for the next six months or a year? And what, I've, what have I heard that I'm going to take back to my part of the organization to make sure it happens? So that's, that's the, um, and by the way, who organizes that? Who designs, who, first of all, who, who designs the session? Well, it's HR because they're the ones that know how to facilitate, design and, and facilitate this kind of a training setting together with, with their senior leadership that decides who's, who, what information people are going to be exposed to. So HR is intimately involved, but HR is also intimately involved in helping to train these people so that they can contribute. Because if they don't contribute, they're in trouble. But if they try to contribute too much and dominate, become obnoxious, they also don't get invited in the future. So. And that, is, and that logic is those people that design and deliver that as part of the BlackRock Investment Institute are heavily, heavily influenced by HR. Uh, let me give you one other quick example. Uh, I can't, uh, I, I blocked out the name because uh, I, I, I had the interview last year, uh, two years ago, I had an interview with one of the leading uh, banks in the world and uh, and I had this interaction who, with a leading, a leading executive in this leading bank. He's one of the top uh, 10 executives in this bank. Uh, and, uh, and he told me this story. When he was a junior analyst about, about 20 years ago, uh, he made a brilliant decision. And, he, and, he, and, and that decision was uh, made, made this bank ton, a whole bunch of money. At that time, this bank, could uh, give a, the the supervisors of, of people could give a spot bonus and it could be lots of money. So this guy was brought in by his boss and said, you know, what you did was brilliant. What a great idea. What a great insight you had. Here's a check for $10,000. Whoa, that's, 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 that was quite a bonus. Plus it was a big honor. So the guy said, thank you. And, 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 and then he got up to walk out. And as he approached the door, his boss said, by the way, uh, who did you share that idea with? Well, I guess I didn't share it with anybody. Oh, really? Well, come back in and sit down. And, 
And so he came back and sat down. Can I see the check again, please? And he, and he, and the boss took the check and he tore, and right in front of him, he tore up this check for $10,000. Then he said, your job is not to be smart. That's not entirely true. Your job is to be smart, but your primary job is to make everybody else in, my, in this bank smart. And I hope you never forget this moment. And this guy said, I've never forgotten that moment. In my entire career, I've, I've made sure that I shared everything that I could with as many people as I could within the bank. And I've also required that of all of my subordinates. That's called relevant sharing. Now, what, what practice was the boss leveraging? That's called measurement and rewards and communications. So maybe we're closer to this information stuff than we think we are. And finally, uh, how do we make sure that it's applied to action? Unilever has, has this brilliant process that actually was, in, uh, was partly designed by Lena Nair. Uh, uh, and uh, and it, is a, it, is, it is really brilliant. It's really a best practice. So, uh, so within a country, within a sector, people meet within us within a sector and they um and they share information on what's going on in the country from around the country and then they and they do that for one sector they do that for the other sector too within the country and then and then they they said so what have we learned and what are we going to do differently in the next year based upon that information and then they share across the sectors and decide what's going to happen in the country so within sector Within sectors, they, 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 they gather the information and apply it to action, and then they do that across sectors. Then that cascades up to the region. And the same thing happens there. The countries within regions share information, decide what they're going to do, then they share information across the sectors, but within a region, and they apply it to action. Then you can guess what happens next. The region information goes up to the, to the headquarters, and, 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 and the region folks argue and debate what's happening on a global scale within their sectors. They identify what's happening, what actions we're going to take. Then they look across sectors and take action. And that process was heavily designed by the, by the, head, by the HR team uh, in Europe interacting with the tech, technical spe tech technology specialists but that process is heavily facilitated up through that chain through people with HR training and background, training and development. That is training and development on a strategic level. And it occurs, so you can see that this logic of HR playing a role in, 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 the, in the role of it, playing a role in acquiring, analyzing, applying information is happening in companies but it's not happening, it's the worst thing we do, but when it is happening, we create greatest value for customers, owners, and shareholders. So that's the way that we start to customize what we do within HR for specific shareholders. And that's what the title of today's session is. How does HR create value for different shareholders? And if you and and this chart is reasonably important because then it tells you for depending on the stakeholders that's most important for you, here's the practice area you're going to focus on. And I hopefully I've given you some examples of how that can happen, first from a strategically integrated HR practice perspective, but also from an HR information management perspective. We could have talked about short-term business performance, uh, but we're pretty good at that. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time on the things we already do well. So that's what's going on in the world of HR and how, and how we can create value for, for our different stakeholders. So we have about five minutes for question and answers, or maybe a few more minutes than question and answers. So I'm happy to respond to any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. 
So, Professor Brockbank, I think you know what you've what you've uh, highlighted here is something which is um, uh, you know extremely interesting, right? It it, uh, it it redefines the role of what HR needs to do. So, one of our participants is asking us, how can we use um, information management for vendors, right? As vendors, as as one of the key stakeholders, and how does that vendor management help us in becoming better organizations? Okay, so uh, I th uh, hopefully the answer is, first of all, we in HR need to appreciate and, and have deeper understanding of what customers require, what the marketplace requires. Then we need to be able to bring that into the firm and, and utilize it internally, but then pass that information also onto our vendors so there's a seamless value chain from customers to us to our vendors. So those all integrate in a seamless way to create value ultimately for the customer because it's the customer that finally takes money out of their wallet to pay us so that we can pay our vendors. I hope that answers so, it. Both. Yeah, so I think sharing information with vendors uh, in timely moments will help them you know, service the company better. Yes. Which in turn, great. Um, so, I think we we also have a question on you know uh, how does uh, you know so how 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 what kind of technologies can we use for stakeholder management? I think is one of the questions that that's here. Okay. Well. One of the things that we focus on in technology is kind of what we're doing today. We need to be more ver we need to be more versant in understanding how to apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other technologies in our in our firms. So, what role does HR play in 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 having the technological infrastructure? Well, first of all, who needs to hire those people? We need to make sure that we de we develop uh, and focus on developing the organization capabilities that uh, that enable technology to be developed within our firms to be applied. But we need to know who those technology leaders are. If you're behind, let me give you an, exa an example. I, I'm familiar, intimately familiar with one company where they wanted to hire somebody who's on the leading edge of technology. This happened to be a, a uh, an investment company with, with which I'm familiar, and they they went they applied artificial intelligence in the following way: they went back through hundreds of millions of economic transactions over the preceding several years, not not too not going back too far, three or four years, and then they looked at at those economic transactions those investment transactions that resulted in success and those that didn't. And, and literally millions and millions of these transactions. And then they identified through artificial intelligence, who are the, who are the individuals and teams within companies, within the investment companies that were, that were making these successful investments. So through that means they were able to identify a very small cadre, like maybe five or six people who were, who were, had a proven track record of of, uh, of performance, and those are the ones they went after. They didn't go get, but they went out. They were successful in getting one. So that is called staffing on steroids. The question is, are 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 your staffing people versant enough with artificial intelligence to apply that kind of logic to facilitate your strategic staffing? That's the role that we play in helping to build that, build the technology infrastructure that you need. We're not going to be technology specialists, but we need to be careful that technology is the means to the information end. Technology is not the end in and of itself. We, technology is a hammer. The house we're building is information. So we need to keep an information hat on as we think about technology. And that takes us back to HR's role 
and acquiring, analyzing, and applying. That's where we can add value in addition to technology. Good question, thank you. So there's also a question that that uh, that comes in, right? So um, you know, I think one of the one of the key things that you talked about was change, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the dynamics of the change that that are there, right? So how how can we sustain strategic initiatives, right? That make uh, an impact across when there is so much change, you know, whether that's change in leadership, uh, environmental factors. So how does HR bring in that semblance and balance? Oh boy, that is a great question. Uh, as you, you know, we are all friends here. <laughs> We're all part of the HR community. And so I hope we can be a little bit self-critical. If you go around companies around the world and you ask what department is the most resistant to change? What are our obstacles to making change happen? Probably accounting had come out number one, and number two would probably be HR. Because once we get our practices, our structures, our infrastructure, our measurement, our rewards, we get our staff, we get all this stuff in place, uh, then we don't want to change it. Because we just, we just hired a bunch of consultants to come in and they designed this thing. And once we got it designed, we don't want to change it. So at least in my experience, I've heard a lot of senior executives say that HR isn't the facilitator of change, it's the source of resistance to change. So that's the challenge we face. Now let's let me let me respond to the question then. I I start off with that example of sectors changing and geographies changing. And those and so you put an overlay of sector change over geographical change that's that's in that where the change is accelerating as you just pointed out in your question so you, so you get these pockets of opportunity that are continually that are co continually coming into existence and then going out of existence so that's the challenge how do you create organization capabilities that uh, that are short term short lived but can create great value if we do it so we can get into these pockets of opportunity and get out of them before these pockets close. That's the mindset we have to have in HR. And we can't, we, we, we simply have to be more ready to adjust everything we do relative to what's happening in our strategic market context. And uh, so we need to be ready. And so how do you do that? Well, uh, again, if we, if we had, an, I wish we had another three hours. We could talk more about how some of these companies do that. But the fundamental starting point is HR folks have to have a deeper knowledge of what's going on in the marketplace, what's going on in our competitors, what our customers are requiring today, what our customers are going to require in the future. And we need to be continually focused and understanding that logic so we can backtrack, therefore, and create the organization capability the re and technical capabilities that are required at that moment, at that time, and then back out if we need to. And by the way, this is not fluff because if we've seen that happen in the last six months on spades and HR departments have simply got to learn to be able to be very fast at responding to these changes and not fall in love with what we've done in the past, but we need to be falling in love with the changes that we need to drive and implement in the future. How do you sustain a culture like that, right? How do you sustain such an agile culture? Oh, yeah, that's a, notice the question. Inherent in that question is a, is a, is a contradiction, isn't it? How do yeah, we sustain, absolutely. sustain how something do we, that is ever changing? Yeah. How do we sustain change? That's right. Uh, and, uh, and that, that has to be a headset, a mindset that, it go, that occurs throughout the organization. That's where we go back to this flow, this information management. The way you do it is you have to surround, identify the most important information that's occurring in the marketplace and, and import that and share it. I, I may have under, understated the, share, the importance of sharing because the goal is to bring that critical external information in and surround, cover the organization with that information. So it's not just the marketing department that's got it, not just the strategy people that have it, 
but the total organization has that information about what's going on in the marketplace, and that and that and that flow of information occurs on a seamless and continual basis, so that as the marketplace shifts, people are accustomed to getting that ongoing continuous flow of, of market information. So they understand when we have to cut costs, we have to be more innovative, we have to up, up our service game, whatever it is, that they're ready to do so because they understand the, the, the what's going on in the marketplace, the importance of what's going on and being ready to respond. So HR's role in creating that seamless flow of information that surrounds the organization that enables them then to respond quickly and be, they become accustomed to changing uh, the, uh, with the changes that they become accustomed to their personal changes as the changes in the in the market environment. That's the way an HR. So that, one final point on that: who's responsible for that? Well, a, marketing will obviously be a very close friend of ours in that process, but marketing tends to not be very interested or have the ability to translate marketing into what into the human implications. We in HR historically have been focused on the human implications, but we haven't been focused on the on the customer implications. And what our data says in that chart that's still showing up, it's the integration of, of bringing together customer information with people's understanding throughout the organization that enables the organization to be agile and to move at, to move as the customer and the marketplace moves. And that's, we, we can play a powerful role in that. Um, so how can, you know, while, while navigating all this, all this change, right. And, and, uh, sharing, sharing all the right information, um, you know, in order to make the change happen, how do HR professionals gain the trust, you know, of, of not just the top management, but you know, every layer across the organization, how do they gain the trust so that they can actually create the change? Because, you know, you can't just think it and the change won't happen, right? You have to drive it. So how do you do that? At the University of Michigan, uh, we have we have the most the longest ongoing and highest level sustained senior level HR programs in the world, and uh, and that and that question always comes up. Uh, and these are really good people from from, from very good companies, and and. It always happens that during the two-week program, somebody asks, but we, under, we understand what you're saying now, uh, you know, that builds on heavily of what we've been talking about today. We understand this now, but our line managers, they, they, don't, uh, they don't see the world the way we see it. They don't trust us. And I said, and, and the response, of course, is, well, three weeks ago before you came to this program, did you understand it? Well, no, actually, we understand a little bit more about HR's value proposition now than we did. But you know what? You've been convincing. You've been spending the last 20 years of your career trying to convince your line managers that we're here to process payroll. We're to make sure that, that benefits are administered. We're here to provide the basic processes of recruitment. Uh, you know, we do basic entry-level training. So, we, so we've spent our careers trying to convince management that we are tactical, that we're tacticians rather than strategists. So the, my point of that is that before we can go back and expect ourselves to be seen as trusted partners, first we need to become, have the information and expertise that give us the credibility to become trusted partners. And the way you do that, and that price of entry is pretty high. That price of entry means we need to have intimate understanding of customers, of our competitors, of what our investors require of us. What are the technologies that are emerging in the marketplace? What is the information requirements that our firm needs to have to compete and win? We HR professionals need to have that knowledge, that base. And on that basis, that when we walk into the room uh, that where the strategy discussions are occurring, then we can contribute and we can begin to translate what's going on in that room into our HR practices. So before we can 
we have to trust is not given trust is earned by the knowledge and skills we have and that knowledge has to focus on our knowledge of customers investors and the processes we use within our firm to add value to customers and investors does that make sense yeah absolutely i think uh, you know, unless unless HR is able to uh, add value to, you know, or at least uh, gain enough knowledge, right, so that they can guide the people who are doing their work um, to add add more value to each of these stakeholders, they will never be able to gain uh, that trust. Like you said, the price of entry is very high, right? I if you're not able to add value to uh, whichever department that you're talking to, if you're talking to the tech team, then you need to be able to understand what they're saying. So you have to learn if you if you want to implement a new uh, AI program within uh, staffing, then you have to be able to understand what they're saying and then contribute back to them. If you don't, then then you know uh, you're not able to gain their trust and you're not able to deliver on that on that program, right? That's hundred percent accurate. Hundred percent accurate. You said it. You said it better than I did. That was very well said. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I think I think one of the you know questions that's that that's that's inherent, right? Is is uh, uh, you know technology is changing. Do we really need to be on top of all the technology changes that are happening, right? I think uh, with AI ML, is that one of the key requirements of uh, HR professionals as they as they want to grow up the ladder. Um, I think the answer is yes, but with the qualification, um, the example I gave of Disney, they use technology that technology to link Ilsa with my granddaughter. Obviously, that was a, a technological linkage. But the HR folks that raised that issue and helped to design it had to have the right question. Technology is the answer, but it's only an answer to the question that is most relevant. And the question was, how do we more effectively link the, the relationship, the psychological and emotional relationship that my granddaughter has with Elsa? How do we leverage that relationship? That's and now once you understand that question, now technology can become the answer. HR may not, well, will not be able to design the technology, but they should be asking the right questions that technology can then answer. And the te and the and the um, the questions that are being asked have almost almost always embedded in them an organizational or human implication. So we need to be asking the right questions that link our people to the customer, to shareholders and investors, and then say, so what could, what you guys in technology, what can you do to help us answer this question? So we need to be asking really, really good and more powerful questions uh, that are strategically relevant in the future than we have in the past, then technology becomes the answer. But first we need to ask the right questions. So I think this might be the final question that we have for uh, this evening in India and this morning for you, um, which is, uh, you know, what are some of the most common characteristics that you've seen in, in HR leaders, right? That have been able to, um, you know, traverse this this world with multiple stakeholders, right? And and do uh, do an excellent job, you know, and really add that value to organizations. Okay, let, let me let me respond with with two with two two uh, two respond two bits of research we've done. First, let's see if I can, can people see that my screen still still. Yep, yep, we can. Okay, let me go back. Let me go back. Okay, in this chart, um, we, 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 you can recognize all of our, our, share, our stakeholders here, right? We talked about those before. Correct. Here we're looking at the impact 
of individual HR competent, of competent HR professionals relative to the activities of HR departments. So this is how effective individuals are. This is how effective our HR departments are. You notice as I've been talking today, I've been talking about HR practice areas. Those are, I've, I've been, talking, been talking exclusively about HR department activities. Okay, now, this, so again, this column, the, the first row asks the question, how competent are HR professionals? The next level down asks how effective are our HR departments? And, what, and this still is the percent of value that's created for all of our stakeholders by having competent individuals or by having effective HR departments. And you can see overwhelmingly, almost to a ratio of four to one, a effective HR departments have four times the impact on creating stakeholder value than do individual HR professionals. That is a really important finding because NHRD and almost every HR association in the world has focused on here's the profile of, here's the competencies that HR professionals need to have. And that's okay, but that accounts for one fourth the impact on stakeholder value than it is when, when, you, when you as, when HR leaders think about how do we get the HR departments to work together? Is that, I hope that makes sense. So having HR, effective HR departments to make sure that staffing, training, development, measurement, rewards, communications, leadership development, promotions, uh, organization design, that all of those integrate and work together are, more, are, are substantially more important than having people that are really have that meet a checklist of, of, of individual HR competencies. So bringing the pieces together makes the HR whole greater than some of the Like okay, the so IBM story. Okay, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's the IBM story. Uh, now, from an individual competency perspective, let me give you one, one bit of advice. We had a doctoral student several years ago who did this research. So you take HR, HR professionals can have three levels of knowledge, knowledge of HR, knowledge of internal operations, and knowledge of external reality. HR knowledge, that's pretty clear. Knowledge of internal operations, uh, that it'd be finance, accounting, order fulfillment cycles, uh, 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 anyway, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Anyway, just internal stuff. And, and then external reality is knowledge of customers, competitors, global financial instruments, um, owner re uh, investor requirements, those kinds of things. Then he asked two questions. One is, how much knowledge do HR professionals have of those three categories? And as you might guess, the thing we have the most knowledge of is about HR. What we have medium knowledge of is knowledge of internal stuff, you know, uh, finance, accounting, order fulfillment cycles, uh, that kind of stuff. And what we have the least knowledge of is is customers, competitors, global financial instruments, stuff that's going on on the outside. So you can see there's a problem, right? If we want to play me, then then our doctoral student. student took all of the companies, about 3,000 companies are in the data set, and divided them into high performance and low performance, and asked the question, how much do these knowledge categories differentiate HR professionals in the high performing firms from low performing firms? And what, he found, what, what do you think he found? So knowledge of HR, how much more knowledge about HR do HR professionals in the high performing firms have relative to HR professionals in low performing firms? And the answer is zero. HR professionals in the low performing firms have the same knowledge base about HR as do HR professionals in the high performing firms. HR knowledge for itself simply does not differentiate performance. 
how much does knowledge of internal operations differentiate HR professionals, high performing firms, and low performers? The answer is medium. And how much does knowledge of external reality, customers, competitors, capital markets, global financial instruments, how much do those differentiate knowledge of high performers from low performers? And the answer is extremely high. So notice that's good, it's bad news and good news. As a field, we don't know what we need to know. But once we understand that the field doesn't have that knowledge, but in places where it is known, it has big impact. That's where we as individual HR professionals need to focus to differentiate ourselves from our competitors, having knowledge of external reality, and then bringing that in to integrate our departments so they all work together to meet customer requirements. Sorry, that was a longer quite longer answer you probably wanted, but that's the, that's the research behind the answer I gave. And I think it's fantastic, right? So you know everything that you said. Uh, I think I think the mindset of what you just said is super critical, especially to um, not just HR folks, but everyone who's uh, running organizations on their own and in the in the top management of smaller organizations. Building this mindset across the organization is one of the key things that's going to uh, help them win in the market. Right. I think that's so, right. You, you're, the, before we before we can invited to the before we can get invited to before we want to be invited to the strategy table. First, we have to have something to contribute to the strategy table, because you don't want to be invited to the strategy table and then have nothing to say or to say something that's inaccurate. So we have to that trust has to be earned that gives us the credibility to be invited to the table. Awesome. I think the <laughs> the audience has thoroughly uh, enjoyed uh, what you have to say. And it was, you know, so some of the things that we're reading, extremely insightful, um, you know, extremely uh, informative. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's, you know, uh, very helpful in trying to, you know, take us to where we want to get to, right? Um, excellent session, right? I think these are some of the things that we are seeing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Brockbank for coming in, making time this early morning. Um, thank you for sharing uh, the wealth of your knowledge uh, from all the research that you've done. I think this audience is certainly enriched. I personally am. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck and God bless all of you.